Laura was a really special patient of mine. Sarah taught me something so important, it completely changed the course of my career. You see, Sarah had been living with her eye disease for nearly 10 years now, and it was starting to catch up with her. She noticed that when she went out, the lights really hurt her eyes at night. The glare was incredible. And her children would laugh at her because she'd be the only mom in the park who was wearing these dark shades even in winter. And so Sarah had been referred to me for specialist contact lenses so that I could use these to help fix for the front surface of her eye that had become misshapen and that was really giving her all of this trouble. So as I got my stuff together, I said to Sarah, you know, how are things going? Tell me about the kids. Tell me about work. You know, how's life? And that's when she told me something that I could not have predicted. Sarah was being fired. She was being let go from work. And that was because her vision wasn't good enough to see what she needed to see at work, to use the computer for the number of hours that she had to use it. And Sarah cried as she told me this. And you know, I cried with her. I was devastated for her. Because in that moment, I realized I had completely failed her. Our whole system had completely failed her. We had been looking after her eyes, you know, and we, we'd forgotten to see her as a person. And it wasn't that my team didn't care. I mean, I worked with an amazing team. We worked in a fantastic hospital. We really prided ourselves on the care that we gave and how well we knew or we thought we knew our patients. But the truth is that we were so busy. We had so many patients to see. We had so much admin to do that we didn't have the time for the meaningful conversations that really needed to happen that might have, that might have alerted us. Because if we'd known a few months before, then we could have concentrated our resources on Sarah. We could have made sure that we treated her quickly enough that actually the work thing, that, that it wasn't a problem. But healthcare right now is reactive. I mean, that's the sad truth. You know, we wait for stuff to happen. And when it does happen, I mean, usually we're quite good at fixing it. You know, we put the team together, we get it sorted but it is late. That treatment is often too late. And it's already had a massive impact on people's lives, just like it was having for Sarah. And that's why I was heartbroken for her. Because it wasn't just her vision now that she was suffering with, but she was about to suffer financially. She was about to suffer in her independence. And that was because we didn't know that we needed to act quickly enough. And that's not just in ophthalmology. You know, this happens across healthcare. We, re we treat reactively. So if, if one of us here had a heart attack today, we'd be lucky to survive, because we'd probably need to know that we were at risk in order to recognize the pattern of weird pain and symptoms that we'd never had before. We'd need to know to ring immediately an ambulance and get to hospital in order to have the treatment within an hour, in that precious hour. And when we woke up from life-saving life surgery, we'd have a team around us looking after us. We'd have our family who would have dropped everything to be by our side with our friends. And we'd be looking at a few days in hospital. We'd be looking at a few months off work because that would be our crisis point and it would change our lives. Everything would stop and that's what happens when we treat reactively. Everything stops while we clear everything up. But that doesn't have to be the case. And I'm excited to tell you that if any of us had a heart attack in the future, it might look completely different. It might look a bit more like this. So you are at a conference, you get a pop-up on your phone, and it says, hey, I've realized the little, the little gadget on your, on your device, and it says, you know, I, I've realized that you, your energy levels have been changing over the last few weeks. And I see that you have a slot in your diary tomorrow. I'm going to book you in for an appointment with the doctor in that slot that you have. So don't fill it with anything else. And before you know it, you're having routine tests 
And that leads to something you didn't realize you, you had a problem with. So you get booked in within a month for a protective heart operation. So that that heart attack, well, it doesn't happen. You take two days off work, you have the treatment you need, and you're back. And that's how proactive healthcare will work in the future. And I'm really excited about that. So if we went back to Sarah, if we'd had the data available to tell us that there was a problem, then we would have seen that in her social media, six months ago, she started declining invitations to go out to parties at night because her eyes, they hurt so much that she thought, it's not worth going out. If we'd had access to insights from her spending behavior, we would have seen that even though Sarah loved to read books, she'd stop buying them because her eyes ached, there was no point. And if we'd had the power to connect up Sarah's health records, we would have seen that not once but twice she had been to see her doctor because of accidents that she had in the kitchen. And that was her symptoms, you know? It was the things that were happening every day at home. It wasn't what I was getting her to read on the eye chart. And so medicine, medicine is about looking after people, being able to care, being able to predict things ahead of time. And that, that is the future um, that, that we're in. And it's really, it's all about data. That's what I'm here to tell you today. It is all about data. And it's about looking for the small patterns that exist, the small hidden patterns within the huge amounts of everyday data that is collected, but which we don't normally see. And the ability to collect that data, it comes from two places. The first one, well, that's technology that exists in our homes. It exists in our cars. It exists in our pockets right now. Those mobile devices are collecting data that could be really, really useful for healthcare. And the second part of the technology is in the analysis of that data. It's about number crunching through to find those hidden patterns. If we tried to do that on our home computer, it'd be quite difficult. It would probably crash because it's a huge amount of data. But there are supercomputers now, and those supercomputers can churn through that data, and they use algorithms to give us insights. And that's what we call artificial intelligence. But in medicine, we don't really like to call it artificial intelligence, right? Because that feels like a little robot that's coming out to give you your pills when you need it. We like to call it augmented intelligence, because it's not about replacing anything. AI in healthcare is about using it cleverly to do the things that will save us loads of time and to free us up to have those really important conversations, like the one that we should have had months ago with Sarah. AI in healthcare is about using, using computers to, to go through the, the administration or the record keeping that we as healthcare practitioners spend 50% of our time doing. Now imagine if we had 50% of that time back. AI in healthcare can be used in order to prevent the double checking, the triple checking of plans and of, of medications and volumes and amounts. Imagine we had that time back. Now, when I realized that that was what AI could do for us in healthcare, I got really excited. And I realized that we needed that in eye care. I needed that for my patients. I wanted to know how they were doing because I wanted them to have a virtual healthcare assistant, not somebody like me who would see them once every three months and be scooping up and picking up the pieces of what had gone wrong in that time. But imagine having a healthcare assistant that could check in on patients every single day, check out how they were doing, and not just their eyes, but actually their whole selves. That's what I really wanted for patients like Sarah. That's why I left my hospital job to set up a company that would be able to deliver healthcare in the way that I knew patients deserved to have it. So I set up Oco Health in order to bring eye care into the homes of patients where they needed it. And so we collect data from tech that's accessible to, by virtually everyone in the world. And you've guessed it. We look for patterns within that data in order to make predictions about how people are going to do in the future and when they need our help most. We use video games on mobile phones, and we collect that huge amount of data, data that we've never had before. But the most exciting thing for me is that that goes into the hands of patients, the ones who should really have access to the records. 
You know, in my future, these records are not going to be held in some storage facility in a hospital. They're going to be accessible to everybody. For doctors, that will free up their time to concentrate on the, on the patients in front of them and have those really meaningful conversations. And for hospitals, we want to reduce the cost of delivering eye care at scale by using the tech that we already have. But it's not all that rosy. You see, tech companies across the world are realizing that healthcare is big business. Tech companies are bidding tens of millions of pounds in to be the next healthcare giant or the world's first healthcare giant. So it's entirely possible that our healthcare in the future in 10 or 20 years is going to be looked after by a tech company. And I always think of AI and healthcare like this extra workforce that we've never had before. You know, we always say that we need more, more people in hospitals. And AI can give us that. It can give us those virtual caregivers. But who will that workforce be working for? Will they be working for patients? Will they be working for profit? You see, AI algorithms in medicine could do some really amazing things. They could nudge our food behaviors, OK? So a lot of the AI, it already knows what food we like to eat. But imagine it could nudge us into to having food that was better for us, you know, our personalized biome, that we could be eating food that was actually going to give us more energy, that would protect us from disease. But what if algorithms were used instead? to inform our caregivers of our sneaky fast food habits that we might have at the weekend. I mean, I don't know how I'd feel about that. Algorithms can be used in order to identify genetic diseases ahead of time. And that's really exciting, like it's already happening, right? So that means that we can treat disease before patients even have symptoms. And that is how the future of medicine is going to look. And that is incredible. That will keep us well. But what happens if those same algorithms are used to work out who's genetically most predisposed to disease? What if those algorithms are used to calculate how much healthcare is going to cost for an individual? I was really shocked this week to find out that that's already happening. And it was badged as a cost-saving thing, you know, so that the hospital could say, well, I don't know if I can treat you because I don't know if you can pay back all this extensive resource that it's going to take to treat you. You know, do we want to start your treatment if we can't finish it, if nobody can pay for it? I was really shocked. AI used in the right way could help streamline hospital services so that patients, when they arrived at the front door, could be analyzed to see how serious their condition was and to make sure that the patients who needed the most urgent and the most complex care were seen really quickly by the people who were most experienced to do so. But what if those same algorithms were used to put a productivity tag on the heads of our individual doctors and nurses? And what if they were measured against that productivity instead of anything else? I mean, that, that could be the reality. I want us to reflect back on what healthcare really means. Because as we healthcare work with technologists, that's what we really need to concentrate on. For me, healthcare, health is about living well. It's about having the wellness and about having the energy, not to just to do the things that you have to do to get through the day, but to do the things that you want to do, to do the things that bring joy in our lives. That's what health is. Care care from a professional perspective is about having the compassion, being able to give that compassion in the way that you would want to receive it. Because, you know, research tells us that when we look back at an illness, what we remember is the people who looked after us. We remember how we were cared for. We remember the people who explained to us what we needed to know to make those difficult decisions. And the people who held our hands through painful procedures. That's what we remember. Because as humans, we have a fundamental need to be cared for when we are ill. We must not, we must not lose sight of that. AI will never replace that human compassion. But if we use it in a really clever way, 
we can use that AI to enable that human compassion and bring that back into the center of what we do. So I'm not afraid of AI in healthcare. I think there's huge opportunities, but we just need to have those difficult conversations, not just as patients, doctors, professionals, but as society. We need to define what our healthcare, what we want it to look like in the future. So let's take this huge opportunity to reflect, reflect on how we want our healthcare to be in the future. And let's think about how we can put the patient back in the very center of what we do, not just use AI for cost cutting. Let's reflect on this opportunity that we have to use AI compassionately, design our healthcare systems of the future. Thank you.